Welcome to Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is The Andrew Lawton Show, brought to you by True North. Coming up, are we headed towards a permanent lockdown? Is pancake syrup racist? And what to look for in the conservative leadership debates? The Andrew Lawton Show starts right now. Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of The Andrew Lawton Show, Canada's most irreverent talk show here on True North. And no, just in case your autocorrect is not, is acting up, it's not irrelevant, it is a reverent, a totally different quality, I assure you, although one that lends itself well to people wanting to accuse me of being the latter. So we'll try to be pretty relevant, talking about the things everyone cares about in Canada, such as Justin Trudeau's haircut. I know it has been like the number one uh, topic, top of mind for all people uh, for exactly zero seconds. Well, in, unless you are talking about CBC. CBC cares about it. Uh, a lot of the mainstream media may care about it. Real Canadians, I don't think, care about it. I, I've got to play this clip for you right out of the gate. Rosie Barton on CBC after Justin Trudeau gave one of his uh, press conferences. I think it was on Monday. It might have been on, on Sunday. Uh, and this is the, uh, the, the stellar commentary from the anchor chair at CBC. Okay, that is the Prime Minister of Canada on this Tuesday morning, and I'll just say what everyone is thinking before we get into the meat of what he said. Yes, he did get a haircut. Yeah, pointing out what uh, most people I don't think cared about. Oh, well, let me let me back up. I thought most people didn't care about it. I might have been wrong. Fresh Daily had a, a story out. Justin Trudeau just surprised Canada with his new haircut. And if you look in the story, uh, it really doesn't say anything about people being surprised. Just a couple of people on Twitter uh, that seem to uh, care about it. But I don't even think really that was all that relevant. I got one as well. So I I'm not judging him for getting a haircut. I actually got one. One on Friday, which was the very first day that it was permissible in my part of Canada, London, Ontario, to get a haircut. And it was great because uh, all of my friends in Toronto couldn't because they were uh, kept back in a, a separate category. But southwestern Ontario, most of Ontario was opened up as far as hair salons and stuff were concerned on Friday. And I normally am not one of the people that has to get everything on the first day. Like, I've never waited in line for the new iPhone. I've never seen the movie on opening day, whatever movie it is. The haircut, I figured I could because the, the place that I go, you can check in online. And I thought, okay, if I can check in online, then I'm not going to deal with this like mad mayhem situation there. I can just show up at my uh, anointed time, sit down and, and get the haircut, and, and then that's that. Uh, it was not uh, that way, as a matter of fact, because the uh, check-in online gave a time of like four hours in the future. So I did my thing. I waited and did some other stuff, puttered around town, went to when I was supposed to go, and it was like this chaotic situation. I wish I took a picture of it, where they had uh, decided to turn the parking lot into a waiting area, and they had like chairs set up six feet away from each other in the parking lot, and they had this whiteboard, and they were trying to tell people the order but they were doing this weird thing where instead of just going with the check-in order, they were trying to mesh when you checked in versus when you showed up. And I was like number two for three people because they just kept adding in like number ones uh, ahead of me, which uh, may have been personal. Maybe they were listeners to the show. Who knows? And then eventually they just gave up on that and just went with the online uh, check-in. And I got in, got the haircut and had to wear a mask. It was actually my first time through the entire pandemic wearing a mask. And I had to wear a mask while getting my hair cut. Uh, the hairdresser, barber, whatever you want to call them, uh, she was wearing a mask mask as well. And it was weird because like, I think my sideburns have, I'm not going to do a close up, but I think they have like a mask, uh, a mask band line on them because she didn't even like take off the mask. And, uh, you know, I couldn't really complain because, you know, nothing works in the last three months. So uh, you have to just be grateful you're, <laughs> you're getting the haircut. And it's funny because I, I generally speaking, view life through the lens that there are good experiences and there's material, there's no bad experiences. So even something chaotic, I, I can usually get a good story out of. But I do find it funny because while I am joking about it and poking fun at it, what's happened in the last three months has made us so eternally grateful to be able to have a haircut, grateful to be able to go to a store, grateful to be able to do this. And it's weird because that gratitude tends to be unhealthy, I think, in the long term, when we have to be grateful that the government has bestowed upon us this great gift of going to buy bread from a store, of going to get your haircut, of going to get your nails done, or whatever the case may be. 
And that's very dangerous because now we see uh, reports out of China that uh, this uh, so-called second wave is coming back. And if you look at some of the things that are, are being uh, discussed there, Beijing has cut all flights. Uh, they have done a lot to put lockdowns in place. They've extended residential lockdowns. Uh, they've tightened even domestic travel. And more than 100 people are now infected in an outbreak that's just been over a couple of days. And the, the Beijing Municipal Health Commission, I, I'm looking here, had reported 27 fresh cases on Tuesday, bringing the five-day total up to 106. And this follows a, a flare-up at the market. Now, I think there are a couple of things to take away from this. Number one, yes, we know that COVID-19 is very infectious. We know that. We, we know it's not a, as deadly as we feared early on, but it is still infectious. But more importantly, we also know that the rest of the world tended to be in the first uh, round of this downstream of China. So something that happens in China very much moves everyone else into this fear of, okay, what do we do? What do we lock down? What do we, where do we go from here? And the danger of this is that it completely forces us into the same situation we've been in for the last three months. So part of the reason I, to be honest, I got the haircut on Friday is because I'm like, I, I just am pessimistic enough that I don't think everything is going to be open and stay open if there's a, a whiff of this second wave, and now there is this whiff, so everything's locked down again. And this is very dangerous because it, it gives government license to say, oh, see, this is why we have to continue indefinitely. This is why we have to just keep going on with this. This is why we can't just reopen and, and say, all right, you know, it's a, a party, everyone have fun, go to the restaurants, go to the patios and, and all of that. So this is the danger we have here. I saw a tweet going around uh, that I want to share with you that, that I think encapsulates why we should be a little bit nervous of how governments will respond to this. It's a tweet that went viral. Here's a call to action for would-be allies. Keep wearing that face mask every moment you're in public and without complaint until a vaccine is found. Doing so protects essential workers, often people of color, and limits our exposure to a medical system rife with bias that can be deadly for us. And uh, this is basically saying that if you don't wear a mask, you're uh, not only killing grandma, but you're also a, a horrible racist. But this has uh, nearly 4,000 retweets, and this whole tweet is based on a, an idea that I've seen a lot of, which is that all of the lockdowns we do, all of the things we do to so-called social distance, flatten the curve, end the curve, whatever, are not just until the curve is flattened. They're not just about ensuring we have hospital capacity, which by the way is what flattening the curve was about. Flattening the curve wasn't about making sure no one got infected. Flattening the curve was about making sure we didn't have an exponential spike that, that would overwhelm the healthcare system. And if you talk to healthcare practitioners, nurses, doctors, and you look at the numbers, by and large in Canada, hospital emergency rooms and ICUs were pretty much empty throughout the pandemic. And I'd say actually less full than usual even because people with other issues weren't going to hospitals because they were scared of the coronavirus. So we didn't have a curve that was anything other than flat. The whole point was never to protect every single person in the country from getting it. It was to make sure that it was managed and measured, which happened. So when the talk now goes to keep wearing the mask until there's a vaccine, keep distanced until there's a vaccine, that was not what we signed up for. It's not sustainable and it's not reasonable. And there's a reason that patios are, are being flooded right now in places where they're allowed, like my little part of Canada. Uh, and that's because people were for three months told you've got to stay home to save lives. They did that. Lives were saved. And it's going to be a very tough sell to tell these people, oh, no, 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 there's no vaccine yet. We, we've got to keep doing this and we can never get back to normal. I went to on uh, Sunday or Monday, whatever day it was, a, a little bakery uh, that that uh, is near my house that I love, and they, they have great bread. And I, I was waiting in the socially distanced line well into the parking lot to get in, and it was a literal bread line. You know, I've joked with my wife all the time, the everything is a bread line. And then I realized I, I was in a literal bread line. And there's a thing about communism is that it kind of sneaks up on you one way or another. Like, we're not staying in the bread line the same way that, you know, Bernie Sanders wants everyone in the bread line. But I was literally in line for bread. And it was just that the metaphor was not lost on me. And I don't think is lost on many other people. 
So right now, when we have this whole thing happening in Beijing, it's giving license to extend lockdowns anywhere and everywhere. We saw in Canada the border closure uh, with the United States was extended until July 21st. Uh, just this morning, as a matter of fact, Ontario extended its emergency order until the end of the month. We've got some provinces like Alberta and BC that are moving in the right direction. Ontario is slowly but surely moving in what I'd say the right direction. But all of that's going to be reversed. First, if we start seeing these flare-ups, as they're being called, like what happened in Beijing. So I'm going to uh, put a, a little pin in this right here and, and say that we need to be a lot more insistent about civil, liberty, civil liberties being protected, a lot more insistent about the science being followed, and not just do what we did at the very beginning of this, myself included, which is to say, listen, we don't know, we have to be cautious, let's just assume the worst and, and prepare for the worst. Now that we know more about this, there is no excuse for following along with the worst case scenario predictions and projections when we know those don't align with what we're actually dealing with. We've got to take a break. When we come back, more of The Andrew Lawton Show. Stay tuned. You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. Welcome back. The fight against racism continues. Uh, more statues uh, torn down. And a little bit closer to home, the city of Kitchener, Ontario, we're told, is thinking of changing the name because of its uh, sordid and racist past. And I, I find this story a bit interesting uh, for the main reason that if you read the actual uh, CTV story about uh, Kitchener uh, renewing a debate about the name change, you'd know that they aren't actually doing anything of the sort. So the headline of the story, Kitchener name change debate being revisited, uh, starts with a, a Facebook post apparently from a, a woman of Kitchener, Jenna Thomas, who says a lot of people aren't aware that uh, Horatio Herbert Kitchener, the namesake of uh, the city of Kitchener, uh, was a successful British general against the indigenous forces of, of Africa, India, and places like that at the time of the British Empire. Okay, he was a military hero. However, he was uh, in also a symbol of hate, they say. Uh, someone from whom everyone needs to detach because of the atrocities and, and yada, yada, yada. Uh, but then you scroll down further in the story, and a, a representative of the city of Kitchener says uh, that they are not at all uh, changing. They, say, uh, they have no plans to revisit their name. Uh, they say, well, we in no way condone, diminish, or forget his actions. Kitchener has become so much more than its historic connection to a British field marshal. Our name is not a celebration of an individual leader's hurtful legacy. Now, the, the city of Kitchener still goes down the road of, of talking about how he was a bad guy, but says they're not changing it. So the uh, Kitchener name change debate being revisited is actually angry woman on Facebook uh, doesn't like Kitchener, which is not news now because everyone's uh, unpleasantly against all names of everything. I, I Like, you cannot like something now. I mean, does Kitchener want to go back to Berlin? Because uh, surely we could say Berlin may have been connected with some atrocities in the past as well. It reminds me of that, <laughs> that Norman. McDonald bit about Germany. There is one country that worries me, though. Not Iraq, not Iran, not North Korea. The only country that really worries me is uh, the country of Germany. I don't know if you guys are history buffs or not, but... Uh... <laughs> And it's actually bad. There's a, a Wikipedia page I came across. List of monuments and memorials removed during the George Floyd protests. Now, this is something that uh, is getting longer and longer, and it's changing by the day. And even from when I first looked at it yesterday, it's gotten a, a fair bit longer. Going around the world, United States, United Kingdom, Belgium, New Zealand, even within the UK specifically, there's a separate page actions against memorials in the United Kingdom during the George Floyd protests. So uh, things that have been vandalized, knocked down, toppled. But, but the list of monuments and memorials removed is massive. And these are, are in many cases being uh, moved by lawmakers or by the people that own them. In other cases, they're just toppled. Uh, people are, are, are pushing them down. Uh, you know, you look at the very top of the list here, statue of Edward W. Carmack, toppled by protesters. 
Uh, you have statue of Charles Lynn toppled by protesters. You have statue of Robert E. Lee at Robert E. Lee High School toppled by protesters. And it keeps going on. So even things that, I mean, but you don't need to topple them as protesters because governments are by and large uh, in rapid, rapid form uh, taking these down themselves. You have a whole bunch of here uh, of, of them here that are listed plans for removal by city, plans for removal by state, removal by city, and, and so on and so forth. And the point that I raised on Monday, I think bears repeating here. Does any of this save people? Does any of this contribute to an actual resolution that pushes racism further and further to the past where it belongs. And this could be applied to Quaker as well, which I don't know if you saw the news has decided it's killing off Aunt Jemima. So Aunt Jemima is uh, going to be no more. Uh, Quaker is going to change the name of this iconic uh, pancake syrup and re recognizes that it was based on a racial stereotype. Now, the brand has been around since the 1800s, and it's undeniably a racial stereotype, which is why the company has over the years uh, tried to amend and has amended the mascot and the logo and the imagery uh, to get from that, uh, you know, minstrel character that it once was, the, the mammy, uh, the mammy character, basically, to something that is just a uh, smiling black woman that's the, the logo now and it was actually a black friend of mine Stacy Washington who kind of just said you know liberals are ruining everything here was a strong black woman mascot or logo uh, and now she is uh, no longer and what Quaker has said here is that we recognize Aunt Jemima's origins are based on a racial stereotype as we work to make progress toward racial equality through several initiatives we also must take a look at our portfolio of brands and ensure they reflect our values and meet our consumers' expectations. So I would say that, you know, from a, a branding perspective, yes, this probably should have changed a while ago. Uh, at the same time, Aunt Jemima is an iconic name. I don't know how you replace it with something that people embrace with the same gusto they embraced Aunt Jemima. But at the same time, you also have to ask why now? Because companies like Quaker have resisted for years and years and years these same pushes, the same arguments, the same circumstances. Uh, this time, it's at this point where the domino effect means that no one wants to be the one to stop it. No one wants to be the one to say, we're not going to go along with this and go down this road. So what happens? Everyone just gives in and they say, you know what? We don't want to risk the scorn of being called racist, so we'll just give in. We'll destroy everything. And move on. Now, I wonder, why couldn't Aunt Jemima be embraced kind of like a Rosie the Riveter type character of, of have a, a strength that comes in spite of the history rather than having to get rid of that history? And that's just one idea. The point is, is that millions and millions of dollars have been made off of this brand. And to say now, okay, we're just going to change it and move on and we recognize it's hurtful, I think is exactly the point here. If companies are doing the bare minimum because it gives the illusion of countering racism when none of these things actually are creating anything positive. And this is the point with taking down statues that we talked about on the show on Monday, that if you destroy things and aren't interested in rebuilding something, all you're left with is a whole, you're not left with anything constructive. And I've got to point out one of the most inspirational stories that I've seen in the midst of all of this, and that's Hal Johnson from Body Break, uh, which every Canadian knows Body Break. You were raised with it, even uh, ones that look like me. I, I may not have followed the commercials, but I saw the commercials of, of Hal Johnson and Joanne McLeod. Two people that from a young age I saw on TV. Uh, and you know what? The one thing that was so fascinating about it is that they never truly opened up about their relationship. Uh, like they weren't o open about the fact that they were married. But I think I just as a kid always assumed they were a couple because they were together. And Hal Johnson said that Body Break actually came about because of a desire to combat racism. And he put a, a very evocative YouTube video out. Uh, let's roll that clip. Hi, I'm Hal Johnson from Body Break, and you normally see me giving you fitness and health tips and being very positive, and I'm gonna be positive now, but you think that Body Break was started because of fitness. Well, it wasn't. It was started to combat racism. That was the number one reason that we started Body Break, Joanne and I. It happened back in you know, April of 1988, and I was wanted to be a sports reporter, and I went to TSN, and they were very open to see me. I went in and submitted my tape. They loved it and I got uh, hired by Jack Hutchison at 11 o'clock in the morning, and he was very enthusiastic about me joining TSN. At two o'clock that afternoon, I got a phone call, 
and he said, uh, sorry, but the higher up said, because I'm black and, and uh, they already had Mark Jones, who's now with uh, ESPN has been there for many years, because they already have a black reporter, they don't want to have two black reporters. Jack was almost in tears and he was very, very apologetic. And I was obviously very disappointed. Um, the, the next month, I then subsequently met Joanne, which was my good fortune and my good luck. And just, we started talking about doing something in television together, something fitness or something you know, uh, along those lines, because Joanne's background. But uh, then on June 8th of 1988, I was doing a commercial. And that commercial was um, at Woodbine Racetrack. And there was three of us. There was myself, a white uh, young lady, and a white guy. And we're rehearsing, cheering. And then after about a half hour of that, just ready before we're going to shoot, the assistant director goes to the director and, and says something. And then the director tells the white guy and white girl to switch positions. So it's myself, the white guy, and the white girls on the end. So at lunch, I then talk to the assistant director as we're in the buffet line. And I just you know, tap him on the shoulder and ask him, why did you switch the two of us? And he said, well, and he laughed. <laughs> he said, well, the client really didn't want you next to the white girl because, you know, and, you know, God forbid, somebody might think you're with, uh, with the white girl. And then he chuckled and laughed and then turned. And uh, I didn't get mad. I just thought about it. And my dad had already, always told me, never get mad at something because when you get mad, you can't find a solution to it. So that afternoon, after, after lunch, I took a piece of paper and I just wrote out kind of a storyboard. And I thought, how can I, how can I change things? How can I make that we can all live, work, and play together? And there won't be um, this attitude that, that white and black and Asian and persons with disabilities and male, female, we all can't be together. So I came up with this idea and the idea is body break. And that was really the formulation of the idea. I then took it around after Joanne and I had produced this, which we had no uh, production background at all, but we took this around to 42 different companies and were turned down by every one. But then I went to TSN again and I saw the, the program director this time, a different gentleman, and he loved the show and I was excited. And he said, yes, we'll, we'll take it. However, the problem is uh, you're black and the young lady, I remember him saying, the young lady is white. And so we don't think the Canadian public is ready for a black and white couple together. And so I, I thought about that and, and uh, he said, if you change the white, uh, the, if you change the person, uh, your part to be a white gentleman, we'll, we'll take it on the air. Well, I went home that afternoon and I looked at the phone and thought, who can I call, what, should, what can I do? Who can I call, what can I do? And after a half an hour of chanting that and looking at the phone, I yelled over to Joanne, who does the fitness and multiculturalism for Canada? And she said, participation. So I then picked up the phone, called participation, had a meeting in two days, and within a very, very short period of time, we had a contract uh, for uh, six episodes, and then we subsequently did 65 for participation. So it was uh, without that, without that um, TSN spawning me to think, to go that route, without the racism that they displayed, without the racism of of uh, June 8th of 1988 by that client at Woodbine Racetrack. Um, all those little things created body break and we're happy to have hopefully given health and fitness tips to Canadians for 32 years, but also enlightened you that we all can live, work and play together regardless of our ability, disability or skin color. What he says there is that it wasn't about fitness, it was about combating racism. He was turned down from a job at TSN because they already had apparently reached their black reporter quota and they didn't need another one. When they first pitched Body Break, uh, they were told that they needed to swap him out for a white guy because, oh, you can't have a, an interracial relationship on television. And what they did, Hal and Joanne, is fought racism the best way they could by modeling an interracial couple on TV. By showing, hey, this is something we're going to normalize. This is something we're going to uh, make so it's not controversial. And this is something that we're going to put on TV so that people see it and so that no one is ever going to say, oh, no, we can't do that. And TSN has apologized. Uh, they, they put out a, a statement saying they're sorry for this, you know, really horrific chapter of their history. The irony is that TSN actually played body break spots, uh, even in spite of what it had done and said to Hal Johnson when the idea first went to them.
But Hal said he he doesn't hold any grudges. His point was that he wanted to fix something. And he said a lot of companies uh, would be very risk averse because they know their audiences are mostly white. So they have to just, you know, stick to what they know. And it was moving because first off, I mean, it's not something I'd ever considered. The past he had, the history he had, I just thought they were two people that loved fitness. And when I saw them on Amazing Race Canada, they were exactly the couple that, you know, I always thought they were uh, as long as I knew they were a couple, which is just a, you know, a fun, really good team. And the thing about it, though, is to learn about what went behind, what went on behind the scenes here. They said, we're going to fight it just by being us. And by creating something, creating something positive, creating something constructive. And it's not as flashy as a statue toppling, but it's also a heck of a lot more long lasting. They're more interested in building statues to good things than taking down statues of bad things. And to see that clip go viral, I I think is a, a great example of how successful they were. And it's not to say that they solved all the problems of the world. It's not to say that they solved racism in television or racism in Canada, but they did their part and they started to be a part of the solution, which is something that everyone needs to do. It's not enough just to identify problems and complain about this, complain about that. What are you doing to solve them in a long lasting way? And a huge, huge, huge gratitude for Hal and Joanne for doing that, not just on fitness and obesity and, and uh, health and well-being, uh, but on race which I don't think anyone knew uh, necessarily was part of their mission, and we know was. Well, we've got to take a break. When we come back, more of The Andrew Lawton Show. Stay tuned. You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. Welcome back to The Andrew Lawton Show. As we uh, close things out for this edition of the program here, uh, we've all been here, uh, by the way. We can all relate to this. A man with horse and buggy furious after being refused service at the KFC drive through he, he did what we've all done at some point in the day. Uh, this man from Carlisle, uh, Cumbria. Uh, and he took his horse-drawn buggy through the drive through at uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and they uh, wouldn't even let him into the drive through They said, you know, we, we can't serve you here, uh, automobiles only. Uh, Ian Bell said he felt absolutely humiliated by it, uh, so he went to get a, a Big Mac instead. And, and evidently, uh, McDonald's does not care about uh, whether you take a horse through the drive through They'll serve anyone, so... Uh, you know, <laughs> I, it's not the horse-drawn buggy that I find hilarious. It's like the feigned outrage of, you know, just being so humiliated by it. I've seen people walk through drive throughs because they don't have a car, and I'm just waiting for, like, a discrimination case to be filed against, you know, discriminating against the uh, those without driver's licenses once uh, one of them is <laughs> turned down, especially now that we're living in an era where all of the dining rooms of these places are closed down. So the drive throughs uh, for some cases, have been the only way to get there, the only way to pick up something. So if you're craving a Big Mac or a a bucket of KFC and all you got is a horse, I don't know how they can tell you otherwise. Uh, Let's uh, spend a couple of moments here, if we can, on the developments in the conservative leadership race. So today we have the first of the debates of the leadership candidates, the four verified candidates, Leslin Lewis, Derek Sloan, Peter McKay, and Aaron O'Toole in French. Tomorrow, they're debating in English. And after that, that's pretty much it. It's not like uh, the last leadership race where you had a bunch of debates across the country. Uh, in this case, because of the pandemic, all of them, all of their campaigns have been done remotely. But this is going to be, I think, a very underwhelming event. And I'm going to be watching it. I'm going to be live tweeting it. Don't worry. I'll, I'll do the dirty work uh, so you don't have to, which is, you know, watching politicians talk to each other. I've interviewed three of the four candidates, and, and I would encourage you to go back and, and take a look at these interviews, Leslin Lewis, Aaron O'Toole, and Derek Sloan. We also interviewed a couple of the others who, who didn't make the, the final ballot. Uh, the one who we didn't interview is not for lack of trying, and that's Peter McKay, who uh, whose campaign ignored every single one of our interview requests. Not even so much as a, sorry, we can't do this. Uh, They ignored every single one. I've had people saying, oh, you know, why are you shilling for so-and-so by not interviewing McKay? And I say, well, the question is, why is McKay not uh, interested in talking to uh, independent media? That's the question that I've put to them and still didn't get an answer. So I would only base what I think of the candidates on the conversations that I've had. If you're not interested in sitting down and and talking to uh, your base, then, you know, quite frankly, I I don't really care what you have to say. But the, the whole narrative that we've seen form 
is that uh, Peter McKay is headed towards a coronation. Uh, Aaron O'Toole is the true blue conservative. Uh, Derek Sloan thinks that none of them are true blue and he's true blue. And Leslin Lewis thinks it's time for something different. That's, uh, you know, if I just distill everything down to a, a single uh, soundbite that is being framed as far as the narrative goes, that's what I would say. Now, I will say, and I, I, I know I have to be very careful here because I, I know that people have very strong uh, feelings about all of them, uh, that I was waiting and hoping for someone to just completely 100% knock my socks off and wow me, it didn't happen. So so with all of the candidates, you know, I kind of feel, oh, well, I don't like about this, but I like this, and I don't like this, but I, I like this. I'm going to have a, a lot more of a detailed uh, analysis uh, next week because I wanted to wait until after the debates to really say, okay, this is what... I, I think, and I, and I don't think I'm actually going to do an endorsement, but I am going to talk a little bit more in detail about uh, who I think is probably more likely to give the conservatives what they need moving forward. But the reason I bring it up now is because everyone has to be very careful about the idea of letting identity politics uh, seep into the discussion here. And, and this is something that came up when I was speaking to Leslin Lewis, where uh, Leslin Lewis had said that the conservatives have a diversity problem, which you can agree or, or disagree with. But a lot of people wrote to me saying they weren't pleased with that uh, because the conservatives have always been the ones pushing back against these I identity focused uh, narratives. And, and what Leslin Lewis had said was that it's not about identity politics. It's just about understanding that a party needs to reflect the country it wants to govern. So that was the, the response that she had given. However, her campaign also did a poll uh, just last week or two weeks ago that I found very disingenuous. They, they polled a bunch of Canadians on the idea of what type of leader they would want leading them. And it listed just a, a few things about them. And in that was sex and race. And it was, do you want a, a former cabinet minister who's a, a non-minority male? Do you want uh, an MP who's a non-minority male? Do you want a PhD uh, holding uh, minority woman lawyer? And at the end of it, they had said, oh, well, you know, 50% of Canadians or 46% of Canadians said they want Leslie Lewis because they picked her uh, resume out of the four uh, resumes they were given. And it had nothing to do with policies. It had nothing to do with platform. It had nothing to do with vision for the country. It had nothing to do with personal capability or competence. It was, we gave you just a few random details and we listed these uh, three are white men, one's a minority female. And oh, Canadians said they wanted the minority female. And, and I think this was something that I have issues with because Leslin Lewis is a heck of a lot more than a minority female. She's very well educated. She's very smart. Uh, but to have this poll and to suggest that it means anything at all, I felt was insulting to the people that uh, Leslie Lewis is trying to get to vote for her. Uh, and, and to say that, you know, we just need to resort to tokenism, which is really how this poll came off, I thought was ridiculous. And, and uh, the reason I, I'm picking on that particular poll is because I felt that that was probably a very dangerous reflection of one thing that I've seen a lot of people say, which is that, oh, we need to choose uh, who we're going to have lead us based on how it will look to the media. And I'm not just talking about identity politics. I'm talking about in general here now, how people tend to uh, view which foot to put forward, not based on what's right or what's sensible or what's smart, uh, but based on how the media is going to respond. And that's the problem with this idea of, oh, you have to have broad appeal. You have to have, uh, you know, a range of, of, of appeal that you give to voters. And this is what Peter McKay's campaign has been saying, that he's the only one that could beat Justin Trudeau. And, and you know, we need a sensible, modern, moderate conservative and all this sort of stuff. And that's what a lot of his surrogates are saying. And the danger of that is that we have gone down this road before. We've gone down this road before. Andrew Scheer, who I like personally, who I've always gotten along with personally, who I know is a, a solid conservative, did not run a, a conservative campaign by any stretch. He went to the most uh, basic of issues of just, you know, pocketbook politics, uh, shied away from a lot of the so-called hardline conservative issues. And as a result, where did it get him? He increased his vote count, but he lost. He lost and, and lost in such a way that he didn't even get to stay on as leader, that the knives were out for him from his own party. People saying that he was too conservative and not conservative enough. So at the end of it, Andrew Scheer didn't even have the support of either the red Tory or the blue Tory faction of the party. 
So when you take that to the current uh, race, we don't have the benefit that conservatives had in 2017, which was like 13, 14 candidates to choose from, where you had everyone from Lisa Raitt to Kevin O'Leary, from Rick Peterson to, to Deepak O'Brien, may he rest in peace. We don't have those options right now for Canada. You've got four. You've got four people which means that the idea of finding someone who checks off every single one of your boxes is probably not going to be there. You have to choose who do you think is the best within that. And it's a ranked ballot. So uh, given that you have two people that are very directly appealing to social conservatives, Derek Sloan and Leslin Lewis, and one who's trying to appeal himself as the second choice for social conservatives, Aaron O'Toole, uh, if, if Leslin Lewis and Derek Sloan do very well, Aaron O'Toole will win. I, I'm convinced that Peter McKay needs to win on the first ballot if he is to have any hope of actually emerging the victor of this race overall. But again, he also, I'm, I'm seeing from a lot of people uh, who are fond of Peter McKay, not just Atlantic Canadians and Quebecers, but uh, people from other parts of the country as well. The number of MPs that he has endorsing him, of MPs that I'm like, you're not a PC red Tory type, but I think that a lot of them believed that they had to hitch their uh, trailer to what they thought was the winning campaign. And I think early on, everyone thought it was going to be a lot more uh, clear of a coronation, which I, I don't think is happening right now. So all of this is to say, here's what I'm looking for in the debates. And here's what I think conservatives with a small C, ideological conservatives need to look for. Someone who is going to be uh, conservative, but not just speak in sound bites. Someone who's going to articulate what conservatism actually means, how it applies to Canada, and more importantly, how to sell it. Because I do believe that there is a, an issue in Canada, not that the message that conservatives sell is wrong, but that they have not done a good job ever of selling it. And, and they shy away from it. They hide from it. They don't want to talk about these things. In leadership races, everyone's all about, okay, defund the CBC and stand up for free speech. And then in general elections, everyone's all about, well, uh, the marginal tax rate, uh, you know, we move it down half a percent and then uh, this tax credit and that tax credit. I'm like, no, we need fire breathers. If we've learned nothing else from the United States in 2016, it is that we need fire breathers in politics in Canada. And that means that you need to have actual fire that you're breathing and you need to have actual breath to breathe it. And sometimes you get uh, neither. Sometimes you get one or the other. We need both. We need uh, a message that's worth uh, you know, shouting from the rooftops and we need someone who's prepared to shout it and actually sell it and not shy away at the first sign of backlash, which you know is going to come no matter what. I mean, even if Peter McKay, who's the former leader of the progressive conservatives, who's a moderate red Tory guy, even if Peter McKay wins, you know, he's going to be like, you know, the worst, uh, most evil, uh, hard line right winger ever uh, to the media anyway, regardless of whether he is or not. So if you're going to get tarnished for being that, I'd rather have someone who's actually open to being that if that's who they are. And, and authenticity is a, a key factor here as well. Uh, so do watch the debate. Do let me know what you think of it. And if you don't want to watch it, I'll be uh, tweeting it at, at Andrew Lawton. Uh, we've got to wrap things up. My thanks to all of you for tuning in. We'll talk to you next week. More of the Andrew Lawton Show then. Thank you, God bless, and good day, Canada. Thanks for listening to the Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.